think uh, I think we're good. Hey guys, and welcome. To the oh, sorry, we're wrong podcast. <laughs> 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 we we can do that. I'm like, um, all right, we're going to start recording. All right, so a whole new thing called the Craig Gibson Podcast, and I'm here with Andy Rajivan from Raw Barbell Club, and so I wanted to. This is the second one I've done in terms Exciting. of Craig Gibson podcast. And I'm, I'm extremely grateful to you, Andy, because, um, you know, I spoke to you a little earlier about some insecurities that I had about, you know, my own, my own journey and, you know, the sound of your own voice and what people think of you. And then you, um, and gratefully, uh, I was grateful that you invited me on to to have a chat and a lot of things changed for me on that day and um, I you set me on a journey where to stop worrying about what other people think and you know to and has inspired me to now start to talk to other people in this format Um, so I thought it was fitting that you know I come out here and to Royal Barbell Club and um, yeah, just check in on you and see what's happening in your life and get to know you a little bit better. So the Craig Gibson podcast is all about interviewing business owners, coaches, athletes, anyone that can bring some value to other people's lives. And I think um, you sum all of those up. You, you know, great business owner, great athlete, great coach and you have so much interesting things to say and I always enjoy our, our conversation so um, I just thank you for everything that you do and welcome. Dude what an introduction. <laughs> um, first off thanks man like that's 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 so cool yeah. and it's, um, it's cool to see like your growth and it's cool that you even were able to attribute like a, a snap change in your mm. life to something and I think like I haven't known you for very long mm. like we're what we what you know we were talking about before fast friends fast friends yeah you know people that people that lean on each other like we do talk reasonably often and we share you know things that are going on in our lives together but we don't really know that much of each other's backgrounds exactly. we kind of started it's 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 kind of cool. It's like coming into the third season of a TV show without watching the the preceding two seasons. Exactly. So I don't I haven't seen any of your flaws. Yep. I haven't seen any of your greatest victories. Mm-hmm. I just know you as the Craig you are today. Mm-hmm. So it's not, my opinion of you is not coloured by that, mm. and your opinion of me is not coloured by any of my uh, my problems or past either. Yeah, um, it's an authentic relationship then. Because you're taking um, a, a friendship on face value, kind of like Tinder. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, so I, I've been single for a little while, and yeah. there have been people like get on Tinder. I'm not ready for that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's a, another whole different podcast. <laughs> but yeah, so in in all seriousness, um, y- you have inspired. Uh, myself to to start this form of communication and the reach that it can have and the impact that it can have on other people um you know i really will forever be appreciative of that and and so today yeah it's just a little bit about those first two episodes um where did you grow up uh i grew up in uh, well, like in sydney yep i'm sydney born and raised mm-hmm. but uh I grew up in Glendenning, which is not too far away. Yes. And it's quite funny that like, even if you move away from this area, so I grew up in Glendenning, I, we moved to Wollongong for a bit and then moved out back to Glendenning and then to Kellyville. Okay. So you kind of go from like, you know, the suburbs in a up and coming neighborhood, which is not a really high socioeconomic area Mm -hmm. to eventually living in Kellyville, which is like a real, it's not like really yuppie area, but like it's, it's a, a place where like 
middle classes. Yeah. And then now I'm back out this way, which is again like starting fresh. Mm. Um, and you know, like it, that might sound like ungrateful or whatever, no. but it's just like uh, <clears throat> if you look at things turning full circle, mm. it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. How long did you go to Wollongong for? We were there for like two two years. Okay, so not long. No, not not super long, but it it made an impact. Yeah. Because that's when I, you know, fell in love with kind of the outdoors. Mm -hmm. um, the lifestyle that that entails is still very intriguing to me. Like yeah. being able to just after school go to the beach. Yeah. Hang out and stuff like that. How old were you then when you moved to Wollongong? Dude, I don't even know. I can't even remember. I would been I would have been in primary school. Uh, yeah. But yeah, you're like super young. Yeah. What are your favorite memories as a kid? Uh, I guess favorite is a is a tough one. I I liked doing stuff outdoors mm. with my family. Um, I really liked toys. Mm-hmm. Um, and I liked playing make-believe, uh, yeah. but like dress up make-believe. Mm. And like, if people know me now, they know that I love dressing <coughs> up as well still. Do you know one thing I didn't know about you and uh, it cracked me up? Mm. Did you go to a comic com or recently? Yeah, yeah I went to comic con recently. Yeah. Like this this year, last year. Yeah. So does that stem from all the way back to your childhood? Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. Yeah, like, so as a kid, I was obsessed with uh, the Power Rangers. Yep. I loved Power Rangers. Yeah. Um, like, so much so that, like, I remember my dad banning me from watching it because, like, I was getting, like, a bit violent and, <laughs> you know, like, you, you break one too many vases and, you know, like, yep. maybe you shouldn't be watching that stuff anymore. Yeah, yeah. Like, why do you have vases around kids? <laughs> yeah, and, you know, pit, uh, pictures hanging on the wall. Yeah. Yeah, or, you know, when I was a kid, we were playing indoor cricket, and the amount of paintings we smashed. You know, why have that stuff in the house? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But my favourite <coughs> thing was to, to dress up like a superhero. Yeah. And, you know, embody that. You yeah. Know, be invincible, be strong, overcome great obstacles, and, and, and play that... Um, yeah. Play that archetype. Yeah, that's cool. Do you have brothers and sisters? I have two sisters. Uh, two sisters, uh, younger, older? Two younger sisters. Okay. Are you guys close still now? Or? Yeah, so like we're close. I'm probably the closest I am to my sisters now. Um, so one of my sisters is only like two, two and a bit years younger than me. Mm -hmm. And we're closest now. She actually lives in Queensland. Okay. Trader. But uh, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, like we're close as now. When we were growing up, we were reasonably close, but you know, as you get to that 18 years old and like your friendship group starts to like meld and mm. it's, it's a really trying time for Absolutely. siblings, especially like one female, one male. Like yep. I didn't like the things she was doing. She probably didn't like the things I was doing and, and vice versa. And now we meet in the middle because we're both adults. Yep. Uh, our youngest sister is like many years younger than her. Like she's only like 20 now. Mm. Um, and like I, I think we're both much closer with her now but she shares a lot of what I love yeah so she's the she's the one that was like come to Comic Con with me yeah the first year and I didn't dress up and then and she did and then this year she was the one that made my outfit yeah wow which was really cool because that was a bonding experience for us <coughs> too she's like will you even wear this if I make it for you I'm like yeah did you, know? you influence her to like comics and no, I think she fell into it herself. Yeah, that's interesting. Where did you, where did your, how did you come about to love it so much? Was, do you remember why? Was there someone you looked up to? Or it just, it just took your interest? It, it took my interest because I like TV. Right. It's what I watched on TV. Like, yeah. you know, I was, I was in the, you know, I was in that age of like before school cartoons, mm. you know, like Cheese TV. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I used to watch Transformers, Ninja Turtles, all of that stuff. I was never a Pokemon guy though. Yeah, okay. 
I did like Digimon. <laughs> Digimon. I don't. What, I don't even know what Digimon is. Yeah. Okay. I'm showing my age. <laughs> How yeah, old are you? Probably, probably an age disparity. I'm 28. And I'm 29 this year. Yeah. Right. Um, well, how old are you? I'm 44. All right, this podcast is over. I <laughs> <laughs> know, oh, mate. Oh, there's so many instances around um, around the gym and life now where I go, yeah, I'm getting old. You could see the... And you, I notice the generation gap. Yeah, yeah, so you'll experience it one day. Oh, dude, I already do. <laughs> and uh, like this TikTok crap. Like, far out. Yeah, what is your, what's your opinion on TikTok? Well, funny enough... I've had TikTok since 2017. Really? Yeah, so I was an early adopter. Yeah. But I only posted one thing and I was like, ah, this is, this is rubbish. <laughs> yeah. It's, but it's blown up. It's growing. Mm. Yeah, so a tradi- well, it used to be for really young um, people, but now it's, um, yeah, everyone's getting on it. Yeah. Anyway, where'd you go to school? Did you, what was your school life like? So primary school, like, so my parents have been really into academics. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they really, so primary school was fine. Um, I did, did reasonably well. I was pushed into academics. Year five, year six were a bit tougher for me. That's when, like, my rebellious side sort of kicked in. I did have a problem with authority a mm-hmm. little bit. You still do. I still do, yeah, I definitely <laughs> still do. Um, but, like... I didn't know how to turn that into a positive. Yeah. Still don't. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, and um, so in high school, that became a big problem for me. And I actually don't have many fond memories of high school. Mm. That was a trying time. But I went to Our Lady of the Rosary in Kellyville mm-hmm. for most of my primary schooling, uh, which is a Catholic school. I was raised Catholic. I'm now staunch atheist yeah uh and then high school i went to norman hurst boys which okay. is a academically selective school mm. when you say high school was was tough in what way just like that's that's when i i started to experiment with partying mm. drugs and and all of that stuff like i've never had issues with those things yeah uh, except for smoking, like I smoked a lot when I was a kid, yeah. which I regret now. Yeah. Um, but that that was when I started doing those things, and they didn't really gel with school life, and school wasn't the best way for me to learn. Like I learned a lot from stuff like this. Yes. Having talking conversations one on one, from listening to people, from not from like rote learning, which is what essentially like your HSC is all about mm. and that's what school is doing school is aiming you like as an arrow towards a target and yes. that target is the HSC mm-hmm. and that is not how I learned so it was very constrictive I didn't like the binds mm. and I, I railed against those yeah do you think you were rebelling against your parents um or my the parents, system the system. Yeah. My parents, <coughs> they they love me to death. Yeah. Um, the only thing I can fault them on is giving me everything that I needed. Yeah. Um, which is bad too because it made me a baby. <laughs> yeah, it, it breeds entitlement. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I definitely have that chip that yeah. I've got to like fight constantly. So they did they did everything right, and they were, I can't. I can't say that they were, they're perfect, mm-hmm. but to me they are. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's nice to hear. Um, people don't get that, man. Mm. Like people don't, a lot of people don't get the, don't have the luxury of saying that their parents did everything for them, and my parents did. Yeah, yeah. Um, did you get into fights at school? Yes and no. Yeah. Um, like I, I I got a couple of scars and stuff from yep. from fights growing up, but not. It was more so like, you know, like my friendship group. If they were in trouble, I'd jump in. Yeah. I. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, like me looking for fights. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, when you left school, what what was life like after that? What did you do after school? Um. So, 
after school, obviously, like my life was aimed at getting into. So I, I got into Macquarie University. Yeah. And I studied business. Wow. How f- and did you continue on with that? Did you finish yeah, your finished degree? Yeah, so I've got yep. a, I got a degree in business administration and a hex d- debt to, Fantastic. to show show it off. <laughs> what was uni life like? I liked uni. Yeah. So uni was the opposite of uh, of school in the sense that yeah, there were rules and and ways they wanted you to learn uh, and, and like ways you wanted you to learn, but a lot of business was especially as you got into the 300 level units mm. so like my degree is a three-year three-year degree um first year is like learning principles second year is like working on those third year is like strategy like how do we put these in place yeah and that is like a game so literally like a couple of those 300 level courses were like you know let's go uh one was a marketing game where you basically launched a product and took it through a simulation and the person who, or the, the team that progressed the best through that simulation essentially got the highest marks. Right. And I think we came, we came like either first or second in that. Oh, mad. Uh, and then the, like a lot of those subjects were like, were like that. Yeah. Uh, and you know, university kind of, so like anyone who's, been to university is like the one thing that sucks is like group projects mm. because there's always someone that's going to drag the chain or or whatever and I learned during university that I could do both yeah right I could either take charge and do things really well mm-hmm. or I could drag the chain and be the guy who's like all talk and no um, no, no action. action what made you pick business it was kind of chosen for me. Like, okay. mum and dad were like, what do you want to do? And I was like, uh, mm-hmm. mm. I, didn't, I didn't have any passions. Yep. I didn't have any academic passions. If I could go back in time, I would definitely have chosen something like physiotherapy. Okay. Because um, I think I'm <coughs> right now in my life, I'm more suited for that. Yes. And I've often thought if I was to go back to university, that's what I would do. Yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah, it's interesting when you look back in hindsight of what you would do differently, mm. but it's your life. And you make decisions at that time based on how you feel and what you're doing at that time. Like if you could change your, um, if you go back time and, and learn a new skill mm. uh, in a professional capacity, like whether that be a trade mm. or going back to school or whatever, what would you do? Mine was, <clears throat> So I was, I was contracted at South Sydney Rugby League Club. So mm. I've never been able to be <clears throat> a builder, carpenter, plumber. I'm not, I can't look at something and go, that's how you fix it. I, I just, and I'm not mathematical, I'm not, um, but I was really good at sport. And I didn't apply myself the way that I should have in rugby league and I could have had quite a, a, a good career um, and I, if I could go back I would put all of my eggs into the rugby league basket yeah. and then go into coaching or administration in a club. If I could go back in time that's what I'd do. So what what's stopping you, I guess if you see the progression of going from athletics to coaching to administration Mm. is there a circuitous route to administration if that was your end goal anyway like is there some way you could float your way into the an admin role right now there is but I've also found the gym environment yeah and I'm sort of I'm getting that satisfaction from managing um managing a business in, in the gym environment okay. and, and that's that's satisfying enough yeah it's um so for me it's about now um building upon that okay yeah the uh, also to the the roles in administration now in in rugby league require you know degrees and uh, you know a lot of experience in that field 
in terms of sticking with rugby league the whole time. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess for, for me, it, I, I'm satisfied with where I'm at in terms of I want to be in that gym environment, um, growing, growing businesses around relationships with people. Yeah. So, but I guess to answer your question, it, I would have applied myself more as an athlete at that time and I gave it up all way too easily. Yeah, so it's more, it's not about where you would be today, mm. it's just the, I don't want to say regret. It's, re it's regret. I, well, I guess it's the regret of not taking full advantage of what you had at the time. Correct, yeah. But that's a lesson too, right? Yeah, I exactly right. And, it, you know, regret's a hard word, but um, every everything that you do in life is a lesson. Yeah. It, it's as long as you, you learn from that. Um, so, yeah, but I do look back on that time as a regret. Yeah. The way to deal with that regret is to... Cry. Think... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's been a lot of tears. <laughs> is to think more... Um, is to try and put a positive spin on it by saying it was a lesson. Yes. <clears throat> so... Because yeah, that's all you can do if you're not crying, right? Is to learn from yeah. that crap and yeah. and make it... Make you stronger. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I, I could have... Um, you know, and it's the potential that was wasted and the could have. Yeah. You know, you'll never know. That, you never know where you could have ended up because of that's that. That's what hurts, yeah. Um, what, what did you do? Did you work during your degree? Yeah, so I actually started Aquaria at, while I was doing my degree. Yes. Um, which is my first business yep. where I look after, set up and maintain fish tanks. Awesome. Um, do you know that I do that? Yeah, I do, oh, yeah. but that's all I know about it. Yeah. So, how did you get your first client? Uh, what, so why did you go into that? I've always, when I was growing up, I the second my second love was animals. Yeah. And I thought I'd end up working in a zoo. Yeah. Or doing some sort of animal husbandry. Uh, I even did my like work experience in year ten at Taronga. Really? Yeah. So I was really going barreling down that <coughs> path. Hmm. Um, it's a very niche market. Yeah, it's a very weird like thing to go from. Like animals and people are like same, same, but very different as well. So mm. it's funny that we ended up. I mean, you two like we ended up in the relationship business because yeah. that's that's what we're in, you know, mm. in gyms. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I was uh, barreling down that path. I got a job at a um, uh, local uh, pet store then moved to another pet store in Auburn, Auburn Aquarium, mm -hmm. where I met really who I'd consider my first mentor, Wayne uh, Bugler. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if I wrecked his last name, but he, he's been in, he was instrumental. He's still in my life. Yeah. He's a older gentleman who owns that store. He was instrumental in my growth as a person. Mm. Um, Can you both share rightly and wrongly. Of what he oh, he's just like, you? you know, like he's business savvy. He's um, he's a fast talker. He's a good salesman. Mm -hmm. He's actually an excellent salesman. Yeah. Like sometimes I've seen him sell stuff that I'm like, why? <laughs> but like he's so good at it. Yeah. Um, and he's he's just he's a really fun <clears throat> fun dude. Like he's he's like 55. He's um, you know he's got a beautiful young Thai wife, um, a lovely family. Mm -hmm. He's. And he's always given me the time of day yeah. to like talk to me, mentor me, um, teach me. So I learned a lot about aquariums and stuff from him. And working there, he encouraged me to when I was like, I want to start my own thing because people keep asking me to come over to their place and um, help set the tank up. Or they like, hey, um, I'm like, okay, like this is how we deal with your issues with your fish tank, with your fish deaths and stuff. Like, oh, can you just come and fix it? I'll pay you money. Mm. And he was one person that was like, yeah, um, like he was doing some of that work. And he's like, you know what? Like, I don't even want to do that work anymore. I just want the shop. How about I give you some of those clients as well? And, you know, like that's that was a big start for me, getting mm. some of those first clients through the shop. Yep. Um, and then I guess the second person that was like a huge mentor to me was someone who I considered my best friend for a long time, who is 
no longer the no longer the case, but Chris Chandler, um, like love him to death. We've just gone down very different roads. Okay, but he was very entrepreneurial, and really pushed me to start Aquaria at that time in my life. Like he purchased my domains for me, you know, built my first website for me. He was the one that taught me how to drive my van because I had never driven van manual before properly. Yeah. Um, took me to go buy my first van. Yeah. And like, so like without him, without these people, like I've, I've always thought I'm like, really just lucky like mm. a lot of the stuff fell into my lap yeah. you know awesome parents mm. awesome mentors people like you that just happen to fall into my life mm -hmm. that give me things I, and i think that's a reflection of the person that you are because you don't want to help people that don't not good people yeah but I'm, I'm sure everyone that meets you feels the same, that you're always there to help others. And you're always, through your podcasts and your coaching and your business, you're always trying to help people. And, you know, people respect that. And that's why you're always going to have good people help you and, and be in your life because that's what you reflect. Mm. But I'm only like that because other people have given me the time of day. Mm. Like, I wasn't always like that. Mm. I, I'd be a taker as well but I'm only like trying to help other people because so many people helped me. Yeah, just trying to give back. Trying to give back all the time. Mm. Where, so are you happy with where Aquaria is at the moment? Um, it's where it needs to be right now. Mm -hmm. I sacrificed a lot of Aquaria to do this. Yeah. Um, rightly or wrongly so, mm -hmm. the only time will tell. Yeah. Um, that's a very, it was a very profitable business when I was younger, mm -hmm. like I, while I was at university, like I was doing really well. Yeah. Um, and then as I took, like if I start, as I started doing more gym stuff, I really let that fall to the wayside. Mm -hmm. And now it's more so like a hobby business. Okay. I have a few select customers that I really like to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, and I do take on new work, but it's only if the jobs are like, you know, like the people are really nice and if they gel with me or if, if they're interesting people that I can talk to while cleaning their tanks. Yeah. Did you recently do a huge tank down in Sydney? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Was, it's still, that job's still going on. That it's was a awesome. big job. That looked awesome. And the dude is like really cool because like, he's obviously like very well off. Yeah. But I've, I've had a couple of conversations with him. Like he's, a, uh, he's in tech, he was in San Fran for a while, like tech startups. Mm. And now he owns like <clears throat> a whole bunch of commercial properties out there. Mm. Uh, and I'd love to have more conversations with him because that street where he lives, like he walks me down the street and he's like, so that's the guy that started David Jones. That's the guy that, you know, owns this business and that mm. business. And I'm like, holy crap, this neighborhood is amazing. Can you imagine like the podcast that could yeah. come out of there? That's where we need to set up podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, interesting. <laughs> Go straight to the honeypot. Mm. Um, yeah, that's... It, it, it always amazes me where people are in life, where they've come from. You know, that's what a street. Mm. Because the view is of the harbour. Yeah, you, the view of that place is Harbour Bridge, Luna Park, yeah. Opera House. Mm. From, from the back of his house. Mm. And that, that fish tank had to be craned in? Yeah. Yeah, it had to be craned in because the it's like right at the bottom of the house and the house is multiple levels and yeah yeah it's legit like yeah uh, again like I had someone helping me on that job so mm. like I earned the job but I subcontracted out to people that know more than me to yeah. make that job happen yeah that's really cool where was your was that what was your first ever job it was a pond. Yeah, it was a pond behind Macquarie University. Yeah, right. It was a strata job, yep. and it was a pain in the ass to do, but the the money that I made from that job bought all of my equipment. There you go. Which yep. is cool, because not many people, like, you know, you run businesses, mm. like, how, how long are you in the red for? Sometimes people yeah. never get out of the red. Mm-hmm. 
right? So, mm-hmm. and that's something I learned early on is like the faster you can get out of red. So for those that don't know, that means like out of debt or whatever, yeah. the better. So I bought all my equipment on credit cards and that job paid for all that equipment yeah. up front. Yeah. Mate, um, I'm a massive advocate now for not having debt and, you know, I, I'm currently personally bankrupt. Yeah. And so I know firsthand the stress and uh, the problems that debt can bring to your life. And, um, you know, it is, it's crippling and it keeps people in jobs they hate. And, you know, any advice I can give to people is to have as minimal debt as possible. Um, and yeah, it, you can be in business uh, for a long time and, and just carrying debt but it's very restrictive, mm. it's a poison. Mm. And I guess this goes to what we were talking about before the podcast, mm. is like, what, owning a business essentially is about profit, right? Yeah. So anything you can do to retain as much profit as possible is the most important thing. But secondary to that is like anything you can do to keep your expenses as low as possible is also super important. Correct. So I would I would tell anyone who's thinking about starting a business to keep their costs down as much as possible when you first start and grow. Don't don't open something that you need to grow into. Open something and outgrow mm. where you were. So a cool thing about Aquaria for me was like the costs were van equipment. I bought the van outright with savings. Mm -hmm. So it meant that I didn't have that liability and everything else on top of that after all that, that, that initial expense was just profit. Mm. And that's what got me through. Yeah. So I bought it. I bought a, I still drive a crappy van. Like it's a 2004 Toyota highest. 2004. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, my first van was like a 90, 97. Yeah. And it, it broke. And yeah. I, so it, it broke down. I gave it away for free. So I didn't make any money on that. Yeah. And then I bought this one outright again. Yeah. Like I've never bought like new cars. I've never had fancy stuff. Yeah. But that's also because like, that's not what I put my money. Like I put my money towards podcast equipment <laughs> yeah, no. and it's not cheap either is it no and you know what i'm super jealous of like how cool your setup is now well i um so like I can, i'm it, talking it, into these mics and i'm like wow the quality this it sounds so rich compared to mine no but that's um and this is um so this has been a floor of mine my whole life is that buying uh, the most expensive yeah, stuff straight up <laughs> straight up you know and then you try and um learn how to use it which you know i wanted to also mention that um you know i'm i'm learning how to to use all of this equipment and like i'm not even at the stage yet of like you've even helped me with video today yeah um but you were here helping me um understand a lot more of the equipment that i have um but I, I, I will admit I'm trying to be smarter with my purchases and I, and I think this, but this brings me so much enjoyment now Yeah. that I'm saving in other areas where I usually would have just spent money or blown my money, but I saved to, for this. For this. And, yeah. um, so it's not know, on the credit card. It's, it's just not on like, credit yeah. card. And yeah, and that's, you know what, it's um, being bankrupt has been uh, such a, a great uh, lesson on how to save. And do you, do you mind talking about no, that? No, not at all. Because I have some questions. Mm. Um, what does being bankrupt mean? Because a lot of people don't realize that being bankrupt doesn't mean that you can't, like people think it's like death. But yeah. a lot of business owners, especially really successful ones, mm-hmm. have multiple bankruptcies. Like yep. it's a learning experience. Yeah. And it does, I guess, affect things like credit scores and stuff. Mm-hmm. But there's obviously advantages to declaring that. Yeah, that's right. So can you tell me about Yeah, it? so a, a lot of my uh, debts were unsecured. So credit cards, car loans, um, uh, I divorced uh, two years ago now. And so just uh, some debt left over from that. And then going into business to set up 
um, the CrossFit Aridi, um was uh, borrowed more money to get into it. Yeah. So that was the the portion that really tipped me over the edge, and I basically just could not service the debt with the income that I was earning. So um, the only option was uh, to declare bankrupt, and it, it, the perception is that seven years and you're yeah, ruined forever. But so kind of like if you broke a mirror. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's it's three years. Yeah. Um, in, it, so I, I was in a position where I was getting three to four phone calls from each institution a day. And it was just the stress of it and how am I going to pay this? So the day that you declare bankrupt, all of those phone calls stopped. All of the credit card limits, my unsecured loans disappeared from my um, uh, bank accounts, and I was left with one savings account. Yeah. And so once you once you apply to, I forget the name of it. Um, there, there is a government department where you um, apply for bankruptcy, and then they contact all of your creditors on your behalf and say, Craig Gibson has declared bankruptcy. Um, you no longer have a legal right to contact him. <coughs> and then they appoint you a, uh, an administrator, yep. basically. <coughs> and to this day, I haven't even spoken to that person, but they advised all the creditors that I was unable to pay the debts and it all just went away. Um, I can earn up to 56000 a year. So it's not like a free pass? It's not a free pass. So then there, there comes conditions. Yeah. So for three years, I can't borrow any money. Um, you, you are allowed to borrow up to $3,000 around that mark, but you have to declare to that institution that, that you are bank. currently bankrupt. Yeah. It's a, it's a crime to, to not declare if you want to borrow money. You, so you can earn up to 56000 a year um, and they can't touch that. They can't touch your superannuation. Yeah. You can own a car to the value of $7,000. Oh, so do you want to buy a van? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I might actually. Um, it's all right, my van's not worth 7000 You have a bit more to spend. <laughs> um, so pretty much um, that's... That's pretty much all I know. Then at, at the end of your three years, which will be the 8th of March, 2020, what was that, 1920, so 22. Yeah. Um, you start with a clean slate and that's it, away you go. But what, what it's forced me to, to do is I now save and instead of Geez, I love those Metcons or Nanos and put them on the credit card. Yeah. Uh, you, I save the money. Yeah. Um, I have more savings in my account now than I ever have because I've always been a spender. Okay. Um, and that's what's got me into trouble. So it's not as bad as what everyone thinks. I'm happier than I've ever been financially. Yeah. Um, and it's because I don't have any restriction on having to pay back money, if that makes sense. Yeah, I does. now have a freedom of, of having savings in the account and being able to do what more things that I like to do with yeah. that money rather than earning a wage and all of it going to rent and debt. Yeah. yeah. I understand, Ding, that I'm not finding fault or that I think that it's bad or whatever, is there any level of guilt that you have to leaving your creditors in limbo, like with, oh, without paying back that debt? Or there was initially. I don't now because, and this, is, this might be wrong, but this is how I, I justified in my mind that all of the debt is unsecured 
Yeah. I so got, they, I got, they knew what they were getting into to an extent. To an extent, uh, they, I never spoke to a person to get any of that debt. Yeah. I used just go online, apply for the credit card. It appears in your bank account the next day. Yeah. You, um, I, I secured a fifty thousand dollar personal loan unsecured, and I never spoke to a person. They put it in my account. It took twenty four hours for it to to okay, lob. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was at a time. You know, uh, this this is for another podcast, but you know, I had a Michelle's Patisserie franchise. Yeah. And the the rules that were broken by the bank and also Michelle's Patisserie as a franchisor to allow us to get into it was negligent on their behalf. Yeah. They like it in their franchise agreement that you cannot borrow more than sixty percent of the value of the franchise. We borrowed a hundred percent. Oh wow. Yeah. And and for people that don't realise like when you buy into like a big franchise, for example, like McDonald's mm. has a really good system. Yeah. They require you to have a year's wage mm-hmm. so that you can support yourself while you're learning the business without drawing from the gym, uh, from the gym, and everything with me is gym, <laughs> uh, from the business. Also, they want, like, I think they ask for you to have a million in the bank yeah. plus the money that you've put towards the, the business. Mm-hmm. So like, they don't want people that aren't financially stable to to open franchises so like that that seems like a really you know like red flag mm. um thing i mean in hindsight yeah yeah in hindsight and and you know just you're excited to ha- open up your own business and yeah. and at the time you oh shit, you know, we don't have 40 percent savings but and then they said oh don't worry about that we'll overlook that but now in hindsight a year later, Michelle's Patisserie sold their business to Retail Food Group. And so they were trying to expand as quickly as possible to gather more stores to make Michelle's Patisserie more viable. attractive and viable to their buyer. Yeah. So they they went against all their own principles and laws. And values. Values and um, allowed a heap of stores. To, they went from like 260 to 360 stores in months, and yeah. and we were part of that. Um, because acquisition is uh, uh, like a very profitable, yes. profitable end goal for yeah a franchise. Yeah. So uh, all of this has occurred in a time where banks have been have just been throwing money at people. Um, and rightly or wrongly, you know, we, it, it, and that and that plays on people's insecurities and and you know people's wants and needs, and you just you easy come, easy go. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I feel bad. I feel less. I do feel like a failure, and I do feel less of a man. Um, but. I've I've come to terms with it, and it is a lesson. Yeah, and um, I'm far happier now now than I was. Look, if um, I would feel worse if I was deceitful in obtaining that money. Yeah, I, I don't know if that even makes sense. No, 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 it does. It does. The only reason I ask is because yeah. I would have had the same thoughts. Yeah. And I do have the same t- thoughts. Mm. Like if I, if I borrow money from friends or Kush, like Kush, financed so much of this gym for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, like we're partners. Yeah. Both in relationship and within the gym, like equal partners. But like, she paid for a lot of crap mm. that I'll never be able to pay her back for at that time. Yep. Um, <coughs> so like, I, I often just wonder like. How, how people feel about, you know, like I'm, I'm a very like, you know, you, you do something for me and like, I'll make sure to repay that. Yeah. So like not doing that is hard. But mm-hmm. then like when you explain to me, like, you know, it's an unsecured debt, it's, you know, these big financial institutions that they, they I'm not going to say that they're, they're predatory. No, no. But, 
you know, like the, the systems are in place mm. with backups and stop gaps to to make it that they're not actually losing out mm. as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, and like, you know, I'm not a, I am a conspiracy man, but if you look at how, you know, like a financial system is set up and how debt is set up and how the banks actually operate, you know, you, you do come to an understanding that, you know, money that goes out is not equal to money that goes in. Mm. There's a reason that we'll never be able to all pay back our debts to Reserve Bank and all of that. Like, that's just how these systems are. Mm. Uh, and, and, and to be honest, like, bankruptcy is a way of protection, protecting a citizen from essentially financial suicide. Yes, yeah. And, you know, we've spoken about this before. I, it led me down to a path where I was planning my own suicide mm. because I, I didn't see a way out. Um, that failure of um, that thought of failure and the overwhelming um, fog of not being able to see out. Um, bankruptcy has been a huge part of um, clearing that fog. Yep. Um, bankruptcy and so, saved your life. Yeah. It, yep. Yep, and some that and a couple of um, key people. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I if anyone does um, need advice or just someone to talk to about that, I'm happy to to talk to anyone about it. Um, and it's something that you, that everyone there's shame around it, um, and you say, "Oh, he's bankrupt, fuck." But um, I'm trying to, by talking about it, say that, you know, reduce that stigma yeah. around it. And people go bankrupt all the time and you don't even know. Yeah. Um, like I'm living a pretty happy life right now and I'm bankrupt. Mm. Um, so, yeah, if anyone needs any advice or just wants to talk about the possibility of it or the overwhelming feeling of debt, I know what it's like. So you just have to reach out. It's cool. It's yeah. it's so cool that you talk about that stuff, man. Mm. Like I'm super appreciative because like I know like some of it, uh, yeah. And like we've talked a bit yeah. about stuff before, but I didn't know the details yeah. or like your real thoughts. Mm. And for some reason, that's the cool thing about podcasts is like it, yeah. you can bring the stuff up that is socially usually unacceptable. Yes. And yeah. and talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. It's Look like right. I want really want to know about TRT as well. TRT. Yeah, oh. That, the testosterone. Oh yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, do you want to talk about? Yeah. Yeah. So, if you're uh, done talking about the other stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I was just gonna quickly say, like, with the banks, they they went to a point where we were borrowing money to get into the Michelle's Patisserie franchise. So I went in it with my parents, mm. and then um, myself and and my wife, um, we had a partnership, fifty fifty each. So my parents, who were, you know, the elderly and um, to to borrow their half of the money they couldn't at the time use their house as security so the the bank said well what about my grandparents using their house as security for the loan so they went in as guarantors so my grandparents went in as guarantor for my parents half now they made up that my grandfather was a wholesale car dealer and made up an income for him. Oh, to get the loan, so which that's is like what the fraud broker well. did. Yeah, you know these are the things that were going on around two thousand five, two thousand six, two thousand two thousand four to two thousand six was fucking good times. The old brokers were just making up shit to give people an income to so get a loan. That happened here. It wasn't just the states and everywhere else. There's mm. a reason it was a global financial car crisis 2008 2009 yeah and that's when it all just melted because it was, was not sustainable people were getting money and not being able to afford the or, you know our circumstances changed um, dramatically when we got into the business but um, you know it's a, another story but um, yeah so when I think about the bank's behavior in the last 20 years I, it softens the blow for me yeah um, and, 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 and for people that are listening, like, I think it's really important for you guys to understand, like, we're talking about this, like, quite freely and 
openly and you you don't take into account the countless hours mm. of of thinking of crying of you know like that destitution that he got before he's able to say it. you know like I, I i do feel bad but i kind of also don't like it's not that he's just like flippant about it mm, mm. like a lot of thought went into that statement you just said right now mate like i said on our, that previous podcast i sat i planned to end my life um i went i had a night where it you know i'm just getting goosebumps now thinking of it, like reliving being at that moment and it was it, it was so close and you know the amount of times just driving in the car crying the you know for this went on for months years of worry and stress and um at the 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 final year before going bankrupt was just it was hell yeah and so literally it has uh, saved my life so yeah it's it's I might sound flippant about it and, you know, it's how I justify it now, but, um, yeah, it's, it, it, you, I'm appreciative that you brought that up because, yeah, the, the months and years of struggle mentally, um, and physically are worrying about it and feeling ashamed and depressed and feeling less of a man, it, it, um, they're all powerful things to to a person's pride yeah um but i'm over all that now excellent and yeah that and i just wanted to, people to know that we don't take the subject lightly yeah. or you know the the paying back of debts lightly like mm. it's it's serious stuff yeah it's just that um we came to it and we, like we don't have much time to talk about this stuff yeah no you just gonna go so, for days like, yeah um and i i tried for a long time and i've paid so much money back yeah. already um, that it's I've, I've paid back hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of interest mm. over a course of the last 15 years yeah um, hormone replacement therapy yeah man like I'm so interested in it like I'm young but like yep. I often think like I want my parents to be around forever yeah I know it's not gonna happen and yep. that's why, like, I force them, I force Kush's parents to come to the gym and train and yep. be stronger. Yep. But, like, a big part of getting older as a dude is not being the spry young 20-year-old you were. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it all started for me, and look, I, I don't know a lot of scientifically about, about I just it. want to know your yeah. experience, man. So there was a number of people who um, were... Uh, so my ex-wife Dion, so she was speaking to um, uh, quite a few um, clients that were, you know, need like ho had hormonal issues. Yep. A lot of women, um, and then like she, uh, thyroid issues, or? thyroid, and just imbalances in their um, <clears throat> in their hormone levels, yeah. and that was you know, affecting. You know, change of life, um, you know, um, a whole heap of stuff. And then there was a couple of guys that she was um, speaking to that, yeah, I just don't feel young anymore, blah, blah, blah. So, and Dion had her own health struggles with hormone balances and stuff. So she started to, um, she saw a number of specialists in relation to her, um, health needs I guess yeah um, and so she got recommended so she was training a client and the client said to her you should go and see these doctors at this practice which is um, Burke Street Clinic down in Surrey Hills yeah and dr. Karen Phelps um, who used to be in charge of the Australian Medical Association and then recently was in Parliament. It's her. It's her practice, and so she went down and saw the one of the doctors there. And she come home and she said, "Look, they're fantastic, and a lot of her issues were sorted out." And she said, 
um, you know, you should come along and, and get a, just a full checkup. And I was like, yeah, I'm 40 now, you know. Um, getting on in years. Getting on in <laughs> years, yeah. You don't feel as energetic and, you know, um, yeah, things hurt more. <laughs> um, so basically it all started for me with just getting a full checkup. Yeah. So I went down. Um, so that's like bloods. Bloods, um, blood pressure, um, a, a whole blood work. And it come back and everything was great except my testosterone level. So the, the markers or what they deem to be acceptable, acceptable is between 12 being the lowest and 28 being the highest. So, so over what would I be at? Like, if you, would you know that? Oh, you should be around somewhere 20 to 28. So okay. up in that 20 region. Anything less than 12, then they strongly recommend medical intervention yeah. or hormone replacement therapy. And what were you? Nine. Okay, so you were far I was, under I was that. below 12, yeah. Um, and so he said to me, what do you do for a living? And at the time, um, you know, I was training a lot. I was working at the gym. And he said, look, I think if, you, if we got your testosterone levels up, then you would feel better. Um, you, the research is that um, having a higher testosterone level longer in life um, prevents or can prevent heart disease, cancers, diabetes, aging. Um, so there's a number of, so I went, let's do it. Um, there's a number of different options that you can have. So you can have a, an injection every four months. Yep. And it's a, uh, a slow, the exact words he used to me is, do you want to feel good or do you want to feel like Superman? Please tell me he chose Superman. <laughs> I chose Superman. <laughs> so. Did it come with a cape and cow? Yeah. <laughs> I wish it did. Um, so the four month injection, it's feeling good. Yeah. The and then there's uh, what he prescribed me and I take now is Sustanon 250. And is it, that an injection? Or is it's that an injection. Yeah. Self. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So you inject it yourself. Um, it's pretty. It's pretty easy. Um, and it is. Uh, I was just wondering what those needles were down. Yeah. Like, no, I'm just kidding. Scattered <laughs> through my car like a junkie. <laughs> no, it's um, it's once a fortnight. Yep. Injection. Um. And um, yeah, that's, so I take, I take that once a fortnight. Um, so to give you some context, I used to t take it. Then uh, once, my, once I separated from my wife, I stopped taking it yep. because I didn't have the money to pay for it, which it costs um, about $30 an injection. And it's not covered by no. Medicare? No. Oh, shit. Yeah, so... That sucks. Yeah, yeah. So, um, $30 an injection, so... Um, yeah. So, that 12, 15 bucks a week? Yeah, yeah. Um, what are your levels at when you're taking it? So, my levels got back up to around 16. Okay. When I was taking it before. Yeah. And then I stopped taking it because I couldn't afford it. Um, and you know, like lower testosterone is very much linked to depression and stuff as well. Absolutely. So like, you know, when you were at your yeah. darkest, like it yeah. would have been handy to still have that, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And also too, it's harder to, low testosterone is harder to put on muscle. Mm. It's easy to gather fat. Um, so well, what, for the last mm, nearly two years, I was not on it and then I started taking it again because uh, in November last year, so only just recently, and um, I've, there's a very distinct um, feeling of from when I was on it before, then the 18 months, two, nearly two years of not on it, and now I'm starting to feel 
the benefit of it of kicking in from taking in November. Yeah. Because it's not as if like you take an injection and you feel like Superman. Yeah. yeah. It's sort of like you. S- you, f- you sort of don't realise you're feeling better, you're recovering a little bit. It's just a gradual. Gr- it's a gradual thing, yeah. and it's not until you stop taking it that you realise. That you realise, oh, okay, that was, yeah, I, I feel a little bit off. Um, so I've got three more, so six weeks to go, yeah. and then I go back to the doctor down at Surrey to Hills retest. to get a, a, a retest of my bloods and see what the levels are there. Will they ever push you up to 20 or will they only ever push you above 12? They'll, medically they can push you to 28. Oh, okay. Because that's so what, uh, within a range. What's stopping you range. from asking them to push you up to 28? I could, so I could go in there and say um, it's not working at all. Um, yeah. and my levels are going to 13, 14, yeah. I want to be at 28, they, it would be at their risk of, gi- of saying, well, I'll, I'll give you more. Or yeah. you, instead of taking it every two weeks, you take it's it every, every week. week. I, they do have that option. Okay. And I, I'm only curious because, like, yeah. if 16 makes you feel great, yeah. like, 28 yep. would make you feel amazing. Yes. I think. Yeah. So I know people that um, are in the same boat. Now they go and get the Sustenon 250 from the doctor. Yeah. You take it every fortnight, but then they also get it on the black market. And yeah, fuck that. Don't do that. That's, no, that's say. ridiculous. Yeah. And I, I'm only saying this because. This is what happens out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I realise that. Yeah. I just want people. To, yeah. Like I'm very mindful that we're having a conversation, but also other people listening potentially. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hopefully, um, that they're then taking it. Um, they're getting extra, and they're taking what they're supposed to a fortnight weekly. Yeah. And some other stuff, and their levels. I've seen the blood tests, and they're at fifty-two. Yeah. That's what? Rid- what's like a like a bodybuilder, do you know? Like, did the doctor ever mention? No, not, never really mentioned that. Yeah, okay. But looking at what 52 looks like does for a 50 plus year old. Yeah. Wow. But I'm happy at around 16. Yeah. That's where I, f- I, I feel good. I could probably um, feel better, but I'm not, I'm not into injections and yeah yeah so that for me um i gotta get my dad to go see this doctor yeah so um yeah burke street clinic they're awesome they specialize in men's health yeah um um i'm trying to think of my doctor's name far out i've just gone blank um i'll put it up later but um we'll just call him doctor test yeah <laughs> doctor test yeah He's he's actually um, he's so go- he's so good. Yeah. He uh, he says, uh, do you want the eastern suburbs like when he d- takes blood? Do yeah. you want the eastern suburbs needle or the western suburbs me- needle? Is the western suburbs needle like used twice or something? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just it's it's thicker. <laughs> and he says, oh, I know people that come to me from out west, they're just harder, they're just stronger, and they're just they're met there, you know. He goes, they're, we're a bit soft here on the eastern <laughs> beaches. <laughs> so that's always good. Um, oh, yeah, good. so um, again, another another stigma that... Um, but our hormone levels affect so much. Yeah. And uh, it, yeah, like testosterone like is like so demonised yeah. because of its effects on sport. But you're not playing sport. No, I'm not playing sport. I just want to... F- I want to... You, you notice, you start to feel... Uh, aging yeah and if the if the testosterone which naturally is produced in the body to regain some of that to help me live a hopefully longer life and a um, a more energetic life I'm not it's I'm not having roid rages or you know I'm not some different person I actually only feel slightly better yeah but I'd rather feel slightly better than slightly worse, slightly, and keep sliding. Yeah, because they're only going to just keep getting lower and lower. Um, so and your body's not naturally 
like you've proven that your body's not naturally able to sustain the testosterone level that is natural for a man. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Like it's nature's trying to get rid of us. Mm. And we want to fight that for as long as possible. Fight I that. want I want you around for as long as I can, buddy. Like a- absolutely. Um, yeah, so it's yeah, again, it's a it's a stigma and um, but if I could got some any advice you know, for you and the family and um, anyone who might be listening is just go and get your bloods worked, checked yeah. every now and then. And it's amazing what you can find and what help is available out there. Yeah, I mean, I like I know I'd said I want to get my dad there, but I'm, I'm tempted to go see it for myself too. Like yeah. I don't need TRT or HRT, whatever you want to call it. But maybe there are some things I can work on. Mm. Like I know that sleep, like lack of sleep greatly oh. drops your testosterone. Yeah. I know that, you know, stress levels greatly drop your testosterone. Mm. But if I know that my testosterone is low, maybe that's the kick in the ass I need to be like, hey, you need to sleep more or yes. you need to, uh, I mean, because that's how my mind work, like, works. I'm like very performance and yep. stuff based. Yeah, 100%. Sleep's another huge thing, and again, this can probably end up being podcast about bloody me. Yeah, that's okay. Because I have sleep apnea. Yeah. Um, and so I sleep with a mask, and so I've. Pat uh, Ned. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I've, I've experienced both sides of the fence of feeling what it's like to have shit sleep, mm. and now feeling what it's like to have a good sleep with. So when you said how sleep can affect testosterone, um, if you have sleep apnea or you snore or you have restricted airway, if you, especially sleep apnea, as you uh, are not breathing, your body goes into a stress mode and dumps cortisol into your system to wake you up. Yeah. To get you breathing again you might not be 100% conscious, but this is what's going on in, in your head and in your body while you're supposedly asleep. So when I had my sleep study, I was having 52 sleep apnea episodes an hour. So every minute or so, I would stop breathing. My body would react, he's not breathing, dump the stress hormone cortisol into it. I'd wake up breathe again and then this would happen you know 52 times an hour now with the mask it happens four times an hour and so the clarity of thought that i have that i wake up i'm not sleeping during the middle of the day i'm not falling asleep at traffic lights um, i'm not waking up with that dry eye feeling like my the life's been sucked out of me because i'm actually sleeping yeah and then obviously when you're you're getting cortisol dumped in your system all night, only a little bit, but it all adds up every night. Um, It's hard to build muscle, hard. It's risk of diabetes, putting on fat, um, heart disease. So why British Bulldogs um, just fat and lazy. There's 100% of British Bulldogs have sleep apnea. Yeah, okay. So they they just accumulate fat. Yeah. yeah, so sleep's very important. Yeah, so that if you are ha- do have let low testosterone, you can look at how you're sleeping. You know, I, I'm I'm not sure what foods help boost testosterone, but there's a lot you can to do naturally before yep. you have to look at hormone replacement therapy. But if your levels are low, you can medical interventions there to help. For sure, as long as you're not competitive in any sport. That Correct has testing. Yes. Yeah. So if you're a weightlifter, crossfitter, powerlifter in a tested federation, like yeah. definitely we're not recommending that. No. It's, you won't be able to compete. This is this is for health. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And longevity. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's yeah, competing days are, are gone now. Um something I wanted to ask you, you're training at the moment. Mm. Strong man. Dude, it's so much fun. How so for those that don't know, I don't know, but why are you doing strongman training and what's it been like? Yeah, so like, I don't know if the guys that are listening even even know this, but like I've been a 
doing weightlifting for yep. like many, many years. Um, a lot of your listeners are probably CrossFitters. Yep. Like yep. Uh, from your gym, your CrossFit gym. Yeah. CrossFit Reedy. <laughs> uh, so I actually started in CrossFit. Yeah. So I'm g- I was going to get to that. Okay. Um, so yeah, I started in CrossFit and, and then found weightlifting and fell in love with that. And, and I, I, I feel like Strongman is like CrossFit. There's so much variety in movement, mm. but it's less reps, less cardio. Still a little bit of cardio. Yeah. So it's like all of the things that I loved about CrossFit and all of the things I kind of loved about weightlifting to an extent uh, mashed into one and then they tripled the weight of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, How's the body feeling? Oh, dude, I'm wrecked. Yes. I'm hitting PRs every week because yep. it's like doing any new thing. Like I've got newbie gains mm-hmm. and I'm learning movements. Yeah. Um, so like you saw my stone the other day. Yeah, mate. That I was like, oh, please get it, Andy. Please don't hurt yourself. Yeah, like it was so close. Yeah. Yet so far away. And you yeah. know, like the, the first time I got that onto my knees, it buried me. Mm. Um, I was like deep in the bottom of like a weightlifting squat. Like I was like lower than Josh Wu, like yeah. <laughs> all the way at the bottom there. And I just, I just no way I was getting up out of it. And yeah. over time, just like your body learns the movement because we know that strength isn't just muscle size. We know it's not just muscle density. Mm. You know, we know it's not just motor recruitment pattern. Yeah, mm. sorry, motor recruitment. We know it, it, it's also just learning the movement. Yeah. And that's what I'm doing now. I've got all the strength that I learnt from weightlifting, from CrossFit, from all of that. And I'm learning how to apply that strength to these strongman movements. Yeah. So I'm, I'm making progress so quickly and I'm learning so much, but it's, it's like being a beginner again. Yeah, that's and cool. And it's really, really cool. Yeah. You've got um, a couple of big mentors. Yeah, I do. Man. Lukey Reynolds and Jordan yeah. Biggie. Yeah, he knows you. He knows mm. you, right, Luke? Yeah. So Luke and I used to, and Dylan Smith and um, Luke's brother-in-law, at, um, we used to train powerlifting and in the in uh, Dylan's garage. Yeah, That's how okay. I very first started powerlifting, and Luke would do his strongman stuff, and I always uh, I admired what he did. Is is like. How do you move that weight, bro? Fuck, he's so strong. Yeah. And it's so cool to have him here. So yeah. He, so I met I met him because of Jordan. Yes. And Jordan was like, hey, there's actually a strong man, professional strong man that lives near you. And I was like, oh, really? Who is he? Never heard of him. Yeah. <laughs> like, and um, I was very much still weightlifting and only just, you know, I, I we played with some strong man stuff. We had a bit of equipment here, but it was just for fun. Yeah. And he um, introduced me to Luke. Me and Luke sat down, had a podcast, and like I heard all these stories about Luke. Like, and you know what mm. his um, his resume is. Yep. But I didn't know his resume, and then you know what his um, like what people think of him. And I I only I only knew a little bit of that, mm-hmm. but I'd heard about it. And then I sit down and talk with this guy mm. for like three hours. We record only like an hour and a half, and I'm like. Fuck, this guy is intelligent, he's mm-hmm. savvy, he's, he knows so much about the history of Strongman. And like this was the, like it's just like the perfect um, storm mm. of like I'm getting into Strongman, I'm thinking about potentially trying to qualify for the highest level within Australian amateur Strongman, which is like the Arnold. Mm-hmm. Um, is that in March? That's in March. So yep. I have qualified yep. um, and I, I did that in uh, last year. Are you like, excited? I'm so excited. Yeah. Uh, but like it was the perfect storm like because I'm, I'm meeting this guy, mm. I'm, I'm hanging out with Jordan, I'm, mm. I'm, like I'm, I'm getting some tips from Jordan and then I'm hanging out at Adonis Penrith with Sean who's now my strongman coach. Yep. So he, you know, I've never really had a coach before. I had someone like Robert Downton a while ago doing like my programming and stuff uh, back in the day, but I've never had someone eyes on me like what I do. Yes. Like I've never had what I do for someone for me, mm. and it's amazing. It's great, isn't to it? To have that. To, and I and I messaged Sean yesterday, and I was like, Hey, man, like I don't, like I don't 
say this enough because like I know how much it means to me when people say stuff like this to me. I'm like, but like, thank you, dude. Mm. Like you've taken me, you know, under your wing. Yes, it's a paid service, but I appreciate the time and care that you spend on me. Mm. I appreciate you looking at my videos that I send you and give me little tidbits. Same thing with Luke, like having Luke in the gym is cool for the gym. Like mm. people just respect him. People train harder when he's here because they know that he's strong and he's worked hard. He's got a presence. He's got a presence. Mm. But then at the same time, Luke's slowly taken me under his wing as well. And he'll offer me little tidbits and bits of advice. And yeah. and even just like the competitive, competitive strongman mindset, mm. you know, like things like, you know, a farmer's carry. Like, if you're lifting a heavy farmer's carry where your grip is failing, where it's a struggle to just deadlift that weight off the ground, not only that, but then you've got to walk with it. Yes. So, like, you walk, you know, you have a 20-meter run, you walk 20 meters, sorry, you walk 10 meters, and you drop the thing. Mm. You know, old me would have been like, oh, fuck, I'll take it back, I'll start again, and I'll warm up, I'll, like, I'll, I'll do what it takes to get it back. But Luke's like... No man, you don't do that. You finish that run. Mm -hmm. You gotta straight away pick that shit up, and and go again. Like mm. the competitor's mindset is like so important in a strong man. Every second counts. Yes. And like you know, if you're a CrossFitter listening to this, that makes sense to you. Mm. But putting into practice, you know, when your hands are bleeding and you have to jump back up on that bar, do another ten pull-ups, or you're gonna lose out on this competition. Mm -hmm. Like. Yeah. There's a certain level of grit that's a little bit different to weightlifting. Yes, 100%. It, grit's a great word. With Luke too, when I was training with him, I didn't want to let him down. Because he, he's, you respect yeah. what, he, what, he, what he brings. For sure. And that brought out the best, I think that brings out the best in people when you want, don't want to let others down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think everything's coming back full circle because I've lost contact with Luke and Dylan um, for a while, and but it's like our our worlds are starting to converge again. Yeah. So tomorrow um, I'm going to talk with Matt Hamilton, who owns Last Round. Yeah. Which do you know much about Matt? No, but uh, Luke keeps telling me I got to go meet him. Yeah, mate. He's just an awesome guy. Hey. Um, like right. I follow, I follow their Instagram. And yeah, I, I watch all of his like, you know, the, the weird news posts yeah. stuff that he's yeah. been doing. Yeah, like, uh, and yeah, like I, I like the stuff that he's putting out. Yeah, I but I'd love to meet him. He just he looks like an animal. Yeah, so he used to be in the um, TRG or the State Protection Group with the New South Wales Police. Yeah. So you know those badasses that when shit really goes down, where they call on those guys, that's him. Yeah and uh, he left the cops, um, was working in as a PT um, at, you said North Richmond gym above the shops there. Um, I forget the name of it. There's another thing when you get old, mate, you start forgetting things. <laughs> and then he opened up his own gym last, last round, round. And yeah. that's where Luke trains. Yeah. So I've watched them grow for the last five years. And- Something to aspire to, right? Like they've got 100%. a good, good yeah. gym. And yeah. Good vibe. Yeah, so um, I'm chatting with him tomorrow and then we'll do a podcast. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that would be sick. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, in a weird way, our worlds are starting to circle around and then now Luke's here. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it's it's good, man. You co you've got such good mentors. Mm. I do. I, like, I've, it's so many people that I can lend. Um, like, I can, I can say that have ha helped me along the way. Yeah. Like people like, even the people like you, like our conversations, people like Steve, who's mm. younger than me. Yeah. And yet like I lean on him for advice. Yeah. Um, like everyone, yeah. you know, Jack, Jack is a huge mentor to me. He's the king of this gym. Mm. Like I might be the owner, but like, you know, he's top dog. Yeah. All right. So. Um, do you think you'll continue on with Strongman after the Arnold's? Yeah, like I think I think I, I think this is something that That's I really part of you now. I really like. Yeah. Um, I would like to be more hybridized. Like yeah. I'd love to continue doing weightlifting as well. Yeah. Uh, my goal this year, uh, and I don't know if I'll actually be able to achieve it or not, is to to do the Arnold, 
qualify for nationals in weightlifting, compete at nationals in weightlifting, and then qualify for nationals in powerlifting and compete wow. in APU in nationals. Animal. That's what I want to do. Um, I understand that I've done weightlifting nationals for the last few years. The standard's a little bit higher this year, but I think I can scrape in. Like, that's what I want to do. I just want to mm. scrape in and go. Um, I think it's possible. I think it's possible because, like, I don't know what APU national qualification is, but mm. I don't think the standard is ridiculously high to get there. I know yep. the standard there is high, mm. but I don't think the standard to get there is as high. Yeah. Um, same thing. Same thing with the Arnold. Mm. Like, I, once I qualified, it was when I realized, like, oh, actually, it wasn't that big a deal to qualify. It's actually a bigger deal to do well. Yes. And that's the scary thing like a lot of people can qualify mm. but what you do when you get there are you there to just show up and participate or are you there to like win mm. and I'm I'm there like I understand that it's a long shot like I'm nowhere near the level that my competitors are at but I'm putting everything I can on the table mm. to to do well. You're like going I'm, with a winning attitude. I'm going with a winning attitude. Like, I'm going there to win events. Mm. There might be events that I zero out on. Like, I can't deadlift the weight that they've got yet. You know, like, my best axle deadlift is 225. The weight is 260. Yeah. Um, the starting weight is 260? Yeah, it's 260 for max reps in 60 seconds. Yeah. And, like, like I'm probably going to zero that event. Yeah. But that 60 seconds, I'm going to be there tugging on that thing <laughs> yeah. like like no tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. And you know what? The adrenaline on the day. Yeah, you never know, you right? You never know. Even you if I could know. break it like an inch off the ground, I'd be like, yeah. Yeah, fuck, I'm getting good. No, screw that. I'm going to lift it. I'm going to lift it. <laughs> I, I, I've got faith in you, mate. Thanks, Ray. Um, uh, do you know how many competitors are competing in March? Uh, no idea. Yeah. Um, what was gonna, I think you can do all three. It'll be, uh, if you just if you, it'll be interesting what you predominantly train. Yeah, but you've got technique down weightlifting. That's sorted. It's mainly the flexibility. Yeah, that you lose. Yeah, doing strongman. I think powerlifting would take care of itself. I think if you trained strongman, yeah, that overall strength would benefit powerlifting and weightlifting more than just focusing on powerlifting and trying to be good at strong like yes do you know what i mean i yeah. think strongman has that overall if you just train strongman you have a good chance of making powerlifting nationals and weightlifting nationals yeah if you just train weightlifting you got no hope the other two yeah if you just train powerlifting you w i don't think the other two either yeah okay yeah that makes sense like i think so like for me uh, my bench is super weak, uh, like for for like a, a like a the high level of powerlifting that I'm interested in. Yeah, for, um, for and, powerlifting. And you and Ash have both helped me tremendously. Like, I, my bench was like 105 when I first met you guys. Yeah. And like, I benched 120 at your comp, mm. which is like, woo, you know, like it's a yeah. huge deal to me. Yeah. Um, and like, you know, Ash was like, oh yeah, like. Because Ash is working here now, yeah, and he's bringing that to the table. Like I, yesterday, he was deadlifting, and I was like picking his brain about like his deadlift setup and how he like yep. pops things up. Um, I'm just gonna plug my charger. In. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm running out of time. <laughs> no, I'm packing up. I'm leaving. Yeah, <laughs> um, no, just good charger. Uh, but yeah, like because he's he's uh, been doing that, so like I think there's a lot on the table I can still learn. Yeah. But I think training wise, I, I'll have to practice the bench. Yeah. Because it's so technical. Yeah. And that just, that comes with time. Mm. Um, and I think what made a huge difference for, for me was, was going from two to three sessions a week on the bench. Yes. And that's what Ash said to me too. Like, you mm. just need to, you need to do it a lot and you need to do it well. It doesn't yeah. have to be heavy. Yeah. But you need contact time with those exercises. It's just, yeah. It's volume, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And it, I guess snatch, clean and jerk, I, I'll have to practice somewhat. Yeah, yeah. Because Just I, to keep that technical skill. That's it. But like, I feel strong. Yeah, you look strong, man. Um, like, those weights are going up, 
but whether they land in the right place or whatever, that's a different story. Yeah. Snatch clean, Jay. Like you said, I think you have to keep working on that mobility. Yes. But I think, man, it's um, possible to go to all three. Um, a little bit about, oh, actually, what I want to ask you is... Did you say Bitcoin? We're talking about Bitcoin. Oh, <laughs> actually, I got a telemarketing call about Bitcoin yesterday. Weird. Um, why do you compete? Uh, I, me and Luke had a long conversation Tuesday night about this. Like, Did you? Why we compete. It yeah. would have been an awesome podcast episode. Mm. Um, for me, the drive to compete is like the relationships. Um, I think I think it's, it sounds douchey saying it. No, not at all. Um, it does Everything's about relationships. Yeah, but like I just meet so many cool people competing, yeah. and it's opened up my entire life. Like competing in sport because I never did sports well when I was young. I was never at a national level. Mm. I was, I never found a passion for sport. And like if you hear me talk about sport with Steve, like I'm always making fun of sports. Mm. But, you know, like weightlifting took me all around the country. It took me all around the world. I've been to China because of weightlifting. Yeah, You know, that's coaching cool. and stuff. Yeah. Uh, so like, it's about the relationships, meeting cool people, <coughs> getting a chat with people, things that some people can go their entire life and not leave where they are, mm. not meet new people. They yeah. might go their entire life and not, not meet ever anyone. Mm. And I've, through these sports, through participating in them, not even like competing at a high level, I've met so many people. I 100% back that up. I, it's very easy to be insular in your gym. Yeah. And I've met the people that I have met and um, been inspired and, and it's you know, given me a passion by going to competitions and, and competing, but also going to support other people and the, the energy in the events and how they make you feel and the people that you meet. Are, are, it's, a, it's a great natural drug. Mm. Um, what's been your top three competitions that you've really, that you've well, I think memorable? The, I think there's Arnold is gonna be in my Yeah, that'll be huge, top. man. Like nothing will ever top the the amount of work that I'm putting in to, to mm. get there, to do do well there. Yeah. And nothing's going to top the experience of making it there. Mm. Which, like, I thought I didn't make it. Um, and that's another, like, story which is, like, heartbreaking and, and cool because we thought Jack made it and I didn't make it. And right. it ended up being the other way around. How did Jack take that? So well. That guy is one of my rocks mm. like I'd say like our core group of like my friendship circle like Shannon Jane Jack Zofia obviously my partner Kush yeah but she's not here so she didn't have to like deal with that as much like she, if I need help I'll ring her she's yep. the person that she, she's she's my rock like, mm -hmm. gay. But like yeah. oh crap I can't say that <laughs> <laughs> but like, for those that don't know yeah Kush, how long have you been together? Oh, like we've been together for like 10 years, man. Yeah, and like, she doesn't live in Australia. No, she lives in Vancouver in mm. Canada. Yeah. Um, she left me mm. alone. <laughs> nah, she, she got a freaking awesome opportunity to work with her mentor, mm. the person that she looks up to the most, the person that is the highest in her eyes of the field of physiotherapy. Yeah. So she had a practice here. She had a good second job. Like she was on the path to to having everything she wanted. Mm. And she got the opportunity to go there to further her craft, to mm -hmm. have a new experience. And you know, she asked me like what what should I do? Should I pursue this? And I was like, "No, don't leave me." <laughs> 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 uh, and like w on one hand I was like that and we had to work through that and on the other hand I was like I don't want to be the person that stops you from doing your things like you've never done that to me mm. you've always pushed me out of my comfort zone to to grow and be better mm. so that, that was, was brave to say that it was a, no, it was an obvious choice 
but not one that I haven't stepped back on. Yeah. Oftentimes, I will still blame her openly for mm. leaving me. Yeah. And so, like, it's not like an open shut, like, case closed. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you should go. It's the greatest opportunity ever. Neck minute, like, hey, yeah. Kush, um, you left me, you <laughs> bitch. Like, <laughs> why? <laughs> <laughs> but that's human that's human nature yes. you know yeah and uh i feel so bad that she has to deal with the duality that i am like the the like i i often tell steve like i'm a man of contradiction yeah like i can be so wise and behave the other way mm -hmm. or i can be so stupid and sometimes behave well mm. it, it's because you miss her yeah i do miss her mm. i'm so lonely yeah <laughs> <laughs> um how long is she there for? So her contract's like two years, yep. which will be up this November, but we don't know. Maybe she'll resign. Maybe she gets a, a good gig. Maybe she just likes being over there. Maybe she likes traveling. Yeah. So who knows where the, where the road may take us. Mm. Life's an interesting journey, isn't That's it? That's it. But yeah. I'm along for the ride. Yeah. Um, and like I said, you know, mm. maybe distance makes the heart grow fonder. Yeah. Maybe, just maybe it doesn't work out between mm. us who knows how how often do you speak and or how often do you see her oh uh, like facetime facetime yeah. yeah like we facetime all the time cool uh like i'll i'll speak to her there might be like two or three days in between sometimes but usually every day we'll say something to each other yeah at yeah. the very least a meme is sent yeah and you recently went over there to see her yeah, last year in July. Oh, so not shit. that recently. So I haven't oh, seen her in, that in months. Tongue goes fast, yeah, yeah, it does, right? Yeah. Because we recorded our podcast before I went. Mm, that's right. Wow. Wow. Mm. Time flies. Man. It does. Um, speaking of time, just tell me when you need to go. I'm good. Yeah. As long as you, you're yeah. okay to keep going. You I'll tell um, me when you need to go. Yeah. I'll, um, we, we're definitely going to have to do a part two. Yeah, that's uh, cool. Um, Opening your business, why did you start a weightlifting club? Or an adult? How did it start? Why your own business? How did you get into all of this, the gym environment? Okay, I will tell you that. Can I add one more thing? Yes. To, uh, one, Kush is coming here to visit in a couple of weeks. So I'm super pumped about That's that. That's awesome. Um, which is amazing, because like one, she hasn't seen like me for a while. Yeah. But two, like I'd love for her to see what the gym is. Yeah. And I think it'll be hilarious that she's an owner of the gym and she'll walk in and there are so many new people here. They'll be like, oh, who are you? Yeah, she'll, they, she's here to sign up. Yeah, they'll, they'll think that. And also like she doesn't have swipe card access. So like she's not even <laughs> going to be able to get in. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I guess she'll come with me, but it's just funny that, yeah. you know, like she's an owner and doesn't have access to all of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, and then the second thing is like the other reason that I compete and compete and train so vigorously for competition is because I own this gym. Mm. I'm a leader and mm -hmm. I lead from the front. The greatest way to be better at anything is to strive to be the best. And if you're if you're doing that, that means competition. Yep. So I will never push anyone else into competing, but understand that if you want to be, if you want to be the best version of yourself, you have to have some level of competition, mm. whether that's in the gym, whether it's outside of it, or whatever. You want to make PBs, you want to fast track your progress, you need a sliding scale of greatness. Mm. So I, I lead from the front because I want, other people to see what I do and be like, oh, I could do that. Yep. Um, I, I could definitely do that. Mm. And I, that's one thing I told Ash the other day as well. Yeah. It's like, hey, dude, like, you wanna you wanna be a coach? You're young. You gotta get that credibility up. Yeah. People need to see how hard you work. No one cares if you pull big numbers in the gym. Mm. But you gotta compete, show people, even if you're shitty. Mm. Like he's not, he's so strong. Yeah. Like the guy has a two thirty deadlift. Yeah. You yeah. know, like he's not a big dude. Mm. And he's getting he's getting better and better. Mm. You know. Yeah. Where, so like where I'm he not could end up at age thirty five. Yeah. And he's young too. How anywhere. old is he? Twenty five. Yeah. So he's young. Uh younger than me at least. 
baby. <laughs> Twenty years younger than me. Yeah. yeah. Um, but like, I, I'm not. I'm not using him as an example. I'm just using because he he started working here. Yeah. And I was like, hey, like you know, you, you definitely. And he he does have competitions that he wants to do. But I'm like, no, you need to compete now. Yeah. He did one end of last year. Mm. He did his first weightlifting competition. I did. As yeah. I saw that. that yeah. Was very cool. Yeah. I think he's uh, he understands that. And may he's gonna he'll. He's got a big future if he wants one in this industry. So so big. He's he's smart. He's mm. I have such intelligent conversations with him. Well, I like brief. Like I don't. Again, I don't know him well. And he's a, like we talked about. He's like a little harder to read. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to like penetrate that that exterior shell that he has. Yeah. And because uh, I want to be friends <laughs> with him. Yeah. And I don't think we're there yet. Yeah. He's. Um, I, th I think he he has positive thoughts and he likes stuff. He he just it, it is it's hard to read. Yeah. But he does. Yeah. Like, like every conversation I've had with him, it's like, wow, that's amazing. Mm. You know. But yeah, he doesn't. I guess it's that outward showing of emotion. Yeah. Yeah. But he, it's it's all inside. But but that's it. I want to get in there. And I wanna, yeah. You know. <laughs> He'll be fantastic here. Oh, he is. He's already fantastic here. Yeah. And I can see it. His attention to detail. Attention to detail that's, is. That's my like. Ooh. Yeah. Shiny toy. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. I, I might be jumping around here, but um, you know, I asked you about how all this started. But is you, uh, you know you've got Steve here now and yeah. Ash. Is there a um, you're trying to get more um, broaden the coaching here? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So Steve has like this extensive CrossFit background he mm -hmm. he and me started training together like 2013 or 2012 something like that yeah and um you know he's one of the best crossfitters in australia in my opinion yeah like he hasn't achieved quite the level that he could and he's gonna get there mm. but he's not only an amazing athlete but i told you before like he's a better coach than me in a lot of ways mm. like he controls the room how old is he he's younger than ash yeah maybe wow. 20 I think he looks like he's 47, <laughs> but he's like 23. And he has the un uneducated opinion of a 47 year old. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I love Steve. Yeah. He's the best. Um, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to, to, to make raw barbell into something great. Mm. And it can't be great if it's just me standing here talking shit how did this start raw barbell um again luck yeah um i loved weightlifting and at the crossfit gym i originally had, was at crossfit norwest they had two people as part of their weightlifting club one was me uh steve actually steve was the first the second person mm -hmm. and then he decided like he didn't want to pursue weightlifting anymore and then so it was just me and the second person was kush mm -hmm. who actually at that time didn't even live in sydney so she's moved away before. She's someone I feel like is going to yeah. move away for the rest yeah. of the world. She was yeah. living in Armadale. <laughs> oh, um, God. Yeah, the worst Armadale, place in the world. Jesus. Um, so, yeah, like she, she, was, she was there and it was just us two. So I'm like training alone in the corner, kind of like what Ash, that, that's yeah. why I see a likeness to Ash. Like yeah. he's at a CrossFit gym, training in alone the outside. Yeah. yeah, training outside. Yeah. Um, so that was me. And I was like, that's why I started like my Instagram accounts, like train with Andy. Mm. You know, like I, I got really into weightlifting really fast and, and fell in love and I wanted more people to train with. So I started, that's when I got into coaching and was like, oh, I'm going to just grow the base of people here that are interested in that. They, start, they were doing barbell classes. So I started coaching barbell classes. Then I was like, you know, like uh, Robin just noticed that I was actually a decent coach. And they're mm -hmm. like, oh, look, you know, why don't you take on some CrossFit classes as well? I was like, yeah, you know what? Like, I don't like doing CrossFit, but I have a, I'm really good at gymnastics because mm -hmm. I studied that. Like, I loved it. Um, and I'm, I've got a real attention to detail. Mm. So, like, of it's course. Fits I'll do perfectly. That too. Yeah. And then one day I was at a CrossFit comp just supporting. And that was another thing that I, I really tried to do, like, be a real part of that community, CrossFit Norworth. And Rob came down to me and he's like, so. I'm going to tell you something, but please don't tell anyone else. And I was like, okay. And he's like, I just bought a gym. 
the second gen. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Mm. Um, have you, like, what, what are your future plans? What are you going to do in the future? Are you going to go open your own weightlifting club or, or gym? Like, no matter what people say about the dude, he's very intelligent. Mm. And, like, I was like, yeah, eventually, probably. He's like, would you be interested in opening your own weightlifting club within the gym that I'm opening? And I was like, huh, maybe? I didn't think this would happen this early. Mm. But like, how can you live, how can you look a gift horse in the face and not take it? So I talked to Kush and Kush was like, you know what, like why, you'd be silly not to do that. And so we set up a deal and, and um, I opened Rural Barbell within CrossFit Norwest in McGrath's Hill. That involved paying rent? Yeah, so it actually so, involved a lot of just uh, taking classes. Yep. So I paid for my um, my rent with my time, which cool. I had a lot of. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was working best of both worlds. Mm. And then I guess the reason that we have this space is because over time, like that relationship and the way that that system was set up wasn't the best for either of us anymore. Mm -hmm. And then that relationship fell fell off a little bit. And, okay. And we ended up here. Yeah, so you outgrew that space? Or you just crossed over too much? Yeah, I would say it's more that. Yeah. Like, it, it became tough to coexist. Mm. On, at least that's what they, they said. Like, I thought we did a real good job of, like, being a valuable part of that, that space. Yeah. From an outsider looking in at that time, it was following you on Instagram it was I, w you were getting bigger it seemed yeah. like and then next thing you were here and in my mind it was like oh okay they just outgrew that space yeah and they moved into here which is awesome yeah so that's what it appeared from the outside and, and, and we didn't like and I, I still have never talked about it and I, and I never will because yeah I'm so grateful mm. to Rob and Jess for for pushing me, up. like I said, a lot of my, like Rob was a mentor for me, Rob and Jazz. Yeah. Um, it's just, sometimes things don't work out. Yeah. And yeah. it's as simple as that. There's plenty of those experiences mm. in life. But they, they, they pushed me to start again. Mm. Like I, I feel like I'm a reluctant business owner. <laughs> I've never, the only time I ever started a business of my own accord, it failed miserably. Yeah, right. And I lost tens of thousands of dollars. Really? Yeah. What was that business? Um, I tried to import something called Robo Snails. What? Ro uh, Robo Snails. So right. you know what a Roomba is? No. Like a r robotic vacuum cleaner? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like essentially that, but for your fish tank. Yeah, right. Okay. And um, there was this new product and I was super excited about it and I miss misjudged the timing, misjudged the pricing, mm -hmm. and I still have like hundreds of them sitting in my garage. You're joking. Yeah, it's crazy. But like, think about like importing like tens and thousands, tens of thousands of dollars worth of product that you've just never moved. <laughs> and so like, I just look at them, like if I go into my room at my parents' house, like there's a bunch sitting there and I look at them and I'm like, that is your biggest business failure to this day. And it, it came, I guess it came from like a lot of the stuff people asked for. Yes. Like people wanted me to come to their houses and clean fish tanks. Mm. People wanted me to train them. Mm. And they asked me before I opened the gym mm. and, and stuff. But like with that, I was like, oh, this is a good idea. Yeah. And it, and it wasn't. <laughs> Can you not sell them at all? I, I look every now and then, they're on eBay. Every yeah. now and then someone buys one. Yeah. And I've like heavily discounted the price just to get rid of them. Like yeah. to just recoup any sort of cost. Yeah but they move so slowly yeah and it's it's very it's a, it's a funny story among my friendship group yeah. that like because it's kind of like you know have you watched the pursuit of happiness no it's a, like a will smith uh, okay. movie where he's selling like these portable x-ray mas machines essentially yeah. and he's he's hustling so hard to sell one and he's it's kind of like a gary v story of him like hustling so hard to sell stuff to then earn an internship and, and, mm. and whatnot. And like, that's what it was kind of like. And I never sold like enough of them. Or yeah. Do you know how many you have left? 
I, I don't count because yeah. I don't want to know. You'll cry. I, 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 nah, <laughs> yeah, I would cry again, probably. I, I, it's really funny because that, that never, again, it was another thing that I lost all that money, but I didn't go into debt to lose that money. Mm. But that was all of my savings at that time. Yeah, so you would feel sad, not cry. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that, that is funny. Because um, you have to imagine, like, if I had a stack of money as big as those robo snails, You'd be cheering. <laughs> You'd have a much bigger gym. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, w what was the feeling of, okay, you're going to have to part ways at McGraw's Hill. Yeah. What was the leap of faith to go into your own facility? Did you consider just closing it down? Yeah, I did. It was really the people that trained you. Yeah. It was, you know, Jane, Jack, Zafia, Greg... Kara, Alex, Kaz, Bo, those, those guys, like the guys that were in our crew, mm. they needed a place to train. They weren't going to go to CrossFit. Yeah. And we'd built something great. Yeah. Something that I was really proud of at the time. Yeah. It looked, uh, watching it from the outside, it looked fun. Mm. And it was fun. It still is fun. Mm. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Like we... We moved here and that first year was obviously a honeymoon period. Yeah. What was it like your first year in here? Raw Barbell? Here? In its current state, yeah. In its current state? It was amazing. Mm. It was fun. Ree, Ree was another big part of that. Someone that I failed, but like was also like the reason that we have the Raw Barbell we have now. Mm. Um, but yeah, like it was a honeymoon state. Like it was, it was fun. Like you imagine what it's like to be in a new relationship. Yeah. That's what it was like here. Yeah, right. That's and a now, lot of fun. And now you have to work to keep that fire. Yeah. Whereas the fire was just there. Yeah. Yeah. You know like what it's like in your relationship. You business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you do differently now than what you did back then? Um, I've had to... I was very controlling back then. Okay. Very controlling of everyone's training. It was weightlifting, powerlifting, mm -hmm. or, or really just weightlifting and a bit of powerlifting. It was, you have to do this this way. Mm. It was stricter. And I've learned to let the reins go. And I think that's a big part of why I can hire coaches now. Yeah. Whereas I couldn't, like I say, you know, I failed Re, like she was our first hire. And uh, I talked to you about this before, was mm. like, even when Ash first came and wanted to work here years ago or a year or two ago, um, and I like, we weren't ready for each other. Mm. Uh, one, Ash wasn't ready to be, be the coach he is now. Mm -hmm. And then I wasn't ready to, to be the, like I'm not gonna say I'm gonna mentor him, but like be a mentor or even just be a good employer to him. Mm -hmm. Like I was a terrible employer to Ree. Yeah, you know, okay. I, I didn't. I didn't pay her well um, because we couldn't afford it, mm. and she knew that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I didn't support her well enough. I didn't take into account her personal life. I didn't. I didn't do a lot of things that I now regret. Or learnt from. I uh, yeah, and I've learnt from that. I probably owe her a call one day to like. Yeah, and we're cool. Like yeah. we didn't end on bad terms. Mm. She was just at a different point in her life, and she wanted different things she didn't want to 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 do this really like her heart wasn't in it yeah but and that, that's cool mm. um what have what have you been some of your struggles that people might not know being owning a business owning a business i mean again like with aquaria like little things get you like i'm i'm easily hurt in the sense that like if someone quits the gym mm. i will fret over that for months. Why? Just because like, I feel like I've failed them. Yeah. I feel like that relationship's gone now because it is. Mm. Like, I'm under no impression that sometimes people are training here not to be my best friends, but for the service, mm. which is good because like, I'm really good at what I do. Yeah. But at the same time, like I'm personally invested in their success and if they leave, then I l lose that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if anyone leaves, if anyone, you know, brings up things or faults, like I don't take criticism very well. I'm, I'm getting so much better at it. Yeah. But even as a child, like 
someone says something bad to me, I'm like, uh, no, you, you're bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I'm, I'm so much more aware of that stuff now that I can, mm. I can work on it. Yeah. And I think that changes as you get older mm. and the more you are exposed to that and being in the gym industry where open to criticism and people are very quick to judge yeah yeah and there's so much competition around and there's so many gyms they can just flip-flop between the relationships sometimes don't matter to to some people yeah but to the gym owner they really do matter um ones that care anyway yeah um so you do take you do take um criticism hard um What do you know? What so social media? Yeah. How important has that been to Raw Barbell, and why do you do it? It's been integral. Mm. Um, I use it mainly to talk to our crew. Mm -hmm. So like our crew is very active on social media. Yeah. Not so much like the greater public, mm. but like I love. I'm so proud of everyone that trains here. Mm -hmm. And like, if you make it onto like the Raw Barbell page or the Raw Barbell story, that means you've probably done something in that session that's like really impressed me. Whether it's your positioning, yeah. your you know, you actually showing up on a regular basis, yeah, or you've done something just so hilarious that yeah, I was gonna say, or failing in an epic manner. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so like social media has been really important to us, yeah. but it's the way we talk to each other mm. um, and sh show off like what we're doing. Yes, um, and that's what I like 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 it about like no, like about it. Yeah. Um, it started because I had mice at home, mm -hmm. and me and Kush filmed our escapade to get rid of the mice that were in our room mm -hmm. um, and we you know like we, I'm talking like we had like I killed like 20 mice yeah in our room wow on in my mouse traps and yeah. stuff and I learned so much about you know getting rid of mice on that day yeah um, what were you using oh just like I mean like we use mouse traps yes yeah. yeah and then you know things like uh, mint like they don't like peppermint yeah they don't like ammonia so mm -hmm. like ammonia spray they don't like steel wool mm. so if you ever have like a mouse hole or a hole that you just shove a whole bunch of steel wool in there yeah and they just won't go near it because it scratches their nose mm. um they don't like bay leaves yeah right uh so there's a lot of things that you like natural remedies to just like curb them away from a certain part of the house right and then you kill them in the roof or yeah or in humane traps, yeah. But like, you know, I, I'm a ruthless motherfucker. So yeah, I'm ruthless <laughs> too. And um, you know what works best on the traps? Peanut butter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I learnt that too. Yeah, I learnt that. <laughs> it's it's never failed me. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Social media is, but I think, so you you record a lot. Yeah. How many? How much time do you spend creating? your social media and podcasts a week? So it depends. Um, I, I have dark moments and like really manic uh, work times. Mm -hmm. So I can be like super lazy and not do anything for like weeks at a time. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that episodes aren't going up yeah. or weeks haven't gone up. Like today, like I've already recorded an episode of a podcast before you got here. Mm -hmm. And then we... We did some computer work, chatted. You, another, and then, you helped me. Yeah, yeah and then <laughs> and then we we were doing this podcast now. Yeah. Um, but then, like, I haven't really recorded. I haven't recorded a raw barbell podcast in like three weeks. Yes. Uh, so, mm. it just depends on the week. Yeah. And that's how I divvy it up. Mm. Uh, a podcast takes an hour and a bit to record, probably an hour and a bit to edit yeah. the video. Uh, maybe a little bit less to edit the video uh, and the and the audio and and put up so that's two hours a week on the podcast on an, each episode yeah uh, our videos I just video while I'm coaching yeah like I've got a little tripod that it sits on and, 
and video and I walk around sometimes. Yeah. I try to catch capture like the most interesting moments, the heaviest lifts, yep. PBs. Yeah. Um, things that are just hilarious because like, people are so funny. Yeah. Like you guys have that podcast at your gym now and like that subpar subpar athlete, athlete po- group. podcast. Yeah. Like like the banter that must go on mm. between those boys yeah. and I've met them like I yeah. like I competed with them yeah. like those guys are hilarious yeah that's how it started was you know the, just the banter that goes on yeah. around the gym is like fuck you know what? this would probably be pretty funny let's see if anyone else would listen exactly um, yeah so like it's it's a it would be a tragedy to me if stuff like that mm. if people didn't get to see that because yeah. yeah like Jack on top of being amazingly talented, strong, um, a commanding presence, he is a leader within this gym. Mm. But the guy is witty, he's hilarious, and he is so smart. Yeah. So the shit that comes out of his mouth yeah. is gold. Yeah. It is, <laughs> I, I really like your page because it's not... You see the serious side of training, but you see the non-serious side of yeah. training and um, you get a really good balance and it looks fun so mate it's a credit to you what you do do you, you did you always feel comfortable in front of the camera or is it something that's developed so i'm still not comfortable in front of the camera mm. if you look at a lot of our vlogs like on youtube and stuff yeah like i'm i wasn't heavily featured until i started training for the Arnold. Like, I would just follow around the guys. Yeah. And you'd hear my voice in the background, but you wouldn't see me mm. um, because it was about capturing their journey. But yeah. now I realize that, you know, like... And I always had that battle because, like, if you if you look at Yannick's Shred Fitness page, yeah. like, that's also his personal page. Yes. He doesn't have two accounts mm. on his Instagram. But I do. So I've always kept things separate. Mm. And now more and more, I'm, like, merging the two a little bit because not only... Am I the owner of the gym? But as we get more coaches and stuff, I'm also an athlete within the gym. Yeah. You know, I, I jokingly said to Zafir and Jack the other day, I was like, hey guys, like, they were like, oh, you're hiring coaches and stuff. I'm like, yeah, man. Like the, the dream would be for me to not coach here and just be a member. <laughs> Cause I, I, I want to train with you guys. You yeah. guys look like you have so much fun. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to be in charge of it. Like, I'm happy to do all the admin work. Yeah. But I just want to, I just want to be here yeah. as, a, as an athlete because <laughs> it's so much fun. Even, and even outsourcing the cleaning. Have you fixed your mop situation? Dude, I wanted to talk about that today. Yeah. Did you see the state of my floor downstairs? No, I didn't. Okay. So, you know, I had that, I messaged you, I asked you. Yeah. You were like, you need to go get this type of mop. I went to Bunnings because I couldn't go to Abco I, at first. I have since gone to Abco. Did it help? Uh, yeah, it did. Yeah, I got the mop. I mean, oh, I haven't used it yet, but okay. the mop's in my van. Okay. Um, anyway, so yeah, so guys, for those that don't know, cleaning a gym floor is the bane of a gym owner's existence. It's shit. You get sweat, there's chalk, there's a protective layer on those rubber mats that you shouldn't get rid of mm. because that's what stops it from flaking. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, it's so absorbent that you have oil stains and stuff from the sweat and people's bodies, right? Mm-hmm. Now, cleaning that, you can vacuum a lot of chalk up, yeah. but you do have to mop up, otherwise you're gonna have the stains on the, on the mats. Now, if you use a cotton mop, what you get is lint and fluff everywhere mm. because the mats aren't, completely flat they grab so I've mopped before and I had that issue Mm. and then I haven't mopped since I've just vacuumed yeah and you know with the heat and with the amount of fitness our guys do like like we're a hybrid gym now we're no longer just waiting there's so much more fitness going on here more strong man more fitness going on here than ever before and that's that's me loosening the reins yeah like I'm not just a a weightlifting gym anymore I do weightlifting we do strongman we do powerlifting we do crossfit Mm -hmm. I've got guys here that are are seriously trying to train for crossfit Mm -hmm. but it's just like an individual basis yeah so you lose that camaraderie that like your gym would have yeah but 
you might gain other things. Yeah. You know, yeah. like it's give and take. Yeah, there's, that's right. It's there's not for everyone. Pros and cons to both. Exactly. There's yeah. pros to the way your gym is set up and there's pros to the way my gym is set up. Absolutely. Um, but the end goal is the same. We're yeah. fighting fatness. <laughs> oh, like yeah, that's, I, and it's always stuck with me um, that our competition is not each other. Yeah. Our competition is the TV and the lounge. Yeah. Exactly, and that's why I brought that up because you said that to me, mm. and it stuck with me. Yeah, that's why we can be friends. That's right, exactly. I've never looked at um, another gym owner since that hearing that um, the same. Mm. It's we're all trying to help people live healthier, happier lives. Um, there's a certain amount of people that are actively doing that already. Um, instead of trying to steal people or say my gym's better than yours and taking people away from each other we need to all focus collectively on the people that are not doing fucking anything yeah for they're sure. going home and watching shit on tv and then just eating themselves to death and diabetes and yeah, yeah don't even get me started so <laughs> dude I, get, I mean like my my strongman coach owns mm. a gym in penrith yeah like he's just down the road like if we were all closed up like i wouldn't be on your podcast you yeah. wouldn't be on my podcast yeah. you know like you know as gym only gym owners we're the only people we got that's right we we do actually need to chat and yeah talk and yeah be together because there's um the, in, there's collectively we can be a powerhouse on our own we'll just die mm. we're you know, so I'm, I'm all about trying to be in that collective environment and learn from other people and, um, you know, who knows where it will end up. Yeah, and like we've talked before mm. about potential like ways we can integrate each other, yeah. things like passport memberships and stuff. And, yeah. You know, like nothing's come about it yet, but, yeah. you know, like the closer we get, the more stuff like that becomes yeah. possible. Yeah, in turn, yeah, like our place needs weightlifting room mm. you, um you might need someone to jump into a crossfit class exactly you know we're talking about a podcast room yeah who knows who knows where the world will take us that's right but what i do know is that it's a far more positive place to think like that yeah rather than be insular and worry about and um, try and sabotage other businesses and to fluff your own ego and try and take all the pie for yourself yeah you know how about we all grow the pie yeah that's and, and take 100%. bigger slices um mop i was mop. talking about mop. yes yeah so what's the so oh yeah so i went to Bunnings. everywhere so like so it's went happened Bunnings. before i went to bunnings there's no like i hadn't mopped yet and i was like i'll go buy the microfiber mop with which is lint what free. you told yep. yeah lint free microfiber mm -hmm. mop and I hope my one that I just bought is lint free. I don't know. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> the lady said... Did you get it from Abco? Yeah, I did. It should be right. Is it the blue one or which yep. one did you get? Blue. Okay. Uh, I hope mine is blue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll show you afterwards. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, I, I went there. They didn't have any microfiber mops. Mm. So I was like, oh, heavy cotton industrial mop, like low lint. And I was like, okay, I'll just get that. Yeah. So I bought a blue one of those, came here cleaned vacuumed everything started mopping spotless i'm like oh this is amazing i've done so well and then it dried man <laughs> it dried and the gym looked like a war zone it looked worse <laughs> that like you can imagine i know that if, i know i've been there man. if i if i got a chalk bucket came up here and just like threw chalk yeah. onto the floor yeah. It would look better than what it looked like after I cleaned the gym. It's soul destroying, isn't it? It it is. And the thing is you can't get rid of it. Like I vacuumed mm -hmm. straight away. Yeah. It wouldn't go. Yeah. It's been like we uh, it's been like weeks and weeks of vacuuming and it's at the state it is now, mm. which still you can see the fluff on the floor. Yeah. But I did walk around down there. I didn't notice it. So it's not it's got better. Yeah. Um I yeah, it's almost like you got to scrape it with a wire brush to get rid to of get it. rid of it. Mm. Um, okay, so we haven't tried the lint-free one yet, so we'll get that out after this. 
Yeah. 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 We'll have a look at it. Make sure it's the right one. Yeah. And do a, a patch first, not the whole gym. So that's what I've learned. Yeah. Like I started with, with the whole gym <laughs> and turn around. What the fuck? <laughs> what is this? What the f And then realized. Yeah. Then we took that. We went and bought another mop. And this, because we just thought that was a faulty mop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But same we bought happened. the same thing and the yeah. same thing happened. But we did a smaller section. Uh, um, that's when, okay, the pennies dropped. Okay. Um, then we went and specifically said, hey, where's all this shit's been left on the on the um, rubber thing? They go, oh, you need a lint-free mop. Yeah. Well, well, thanks for telling us that before. Um, well, you know, probably they can't read minds, but um, it's so much better now. That's it, awesome. It leave, doesn't leave anything. So the, the, the funny part of the story, though, is that I had reached out to you yeah. and told you my predicament. You gave me sound advice, and then I ignored it <laughs> and, and just tried to do it my way. And it's, it's just funny, like someone who talks about growth, about learning from other people. Yeah. And, like, and it's like I was talking about before, like I'm a walking contradiction. Like I, I asked for advice, and then I didn't take it. <laughs> Had to learn from my from myself again. Like I've already done this. I've already made that mistake. Yeah. And I mopped the whole gym again, and I had to go through it all over. Sometimes we need those lessons. Yeah, it's slow learner sometimes. <laughs> Mate, um, no, nah, it's all good. Well, I, hopefully this one will work, and we can get that <laughs> sorted. Um, I think we're all a um, humans of contradiction, mm. uh, especially when we when we. Just life's funny, isn't it? Yeah. I just feel like I'm constantly a hypocrite. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But, yeah. You either love me or you don't. It is what it is. That's it. Um, mate, I have to go. I'm cool. This I'm is probably sorry. a good place to finish. Yeah, great. Um, great place. We should do this again. Sure. More often. Um, how can people find you? So, guys, you can find me at Train With Andy on Instagram. Mm-hmm or at Raw Barbell Club on Instagram or all of the gym social media. So that's Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Check us out. We have a podcast as well. Yep. Craig's been on it. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be cool if you check that out. And yeah, yeah, guys, like if, you, if you're interested in training, if you just want to chat, reach out to Craig, reach out to me. Mm -hmm. It'd be cool. Uneducated Opinions. Oh yeah, I have another podcast with yep. um, Steve. It's called at, it's at Uneducated Opinions. That's where we talk about more life stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it's like two guys drinking beers and just talking talking about things that they have no business talking about. Really. Yeah, tackling some big issues. W with, with very little insight. <laughs> it's a silly podcast, but it's so much fun. It's great. Um, both the podcasts, Raw Barbell Club and Uneducated Opinions, they're, they're enjoyable, mate, and educational. And if you haven't already, check them out, subscribe. Um, you won't regret it. Thanks, Dave. That's a glowing endorsement. <laughs> um, Andy, just to finish off, um, you know, I admire what you're doing here at Raw Barbell Club. Um, I admire every time I've reached out to you, you've been... Um, so giving of your time so helpful of your time and you had no reason to to other than being a good person um, I over time hopefully I can give you the insight of what the impact you have had on me um, and I'll forever be um, grateful for the time that you've given me and the help that you've given me so thank you and um, mate hopefully this is just the beginning of you know, uh, working on projects together and, and growing that, that pie of helping people be happier and healthier and educating everyone. Yeah, man. So, um, mate, thank you. Just keep doing what you're doing. Keep fighting the good fight. That's it. Thanks, brother.